Okay, buckle in. This is gonna be messy. Games Workshop have recently gone after a small content creator who also happens to be the YouTuber Commissar Gamza, which is, yeah, <laughs> this is gonna be a tough video for me. So for those who don't know Commissar Gamza, don't worry about it, you're living in the Garden of Eden, don't eat the fruit. Sadly, I think I do have to sneak you a little bit here. He is a YouTuber who sort of covers Games Workshop. He sort of covers 3D printing as well, but he does so with a very specific, uh, let's just say perspective. Commissar Gamza is the type of guy who would, in real life, support the Emperor. And he also strikes me as the kind of guy who'd also be against the Sisters of Battle because, you know, they're able to go outside. So I just want to go on record right now. I am not in favor of living under the Imperium of Man. For one, I like having shoes. But this video is not about Gamza. They're not about his politics or his takes on things. No, it's instead a video about what Games Workshop have done, which is a bit of a recurring theme of the channel. But I want to talk about that today because Games Workshop have come for him. Yes, that is actually correct. Games Workshop have indeed come for Commissar Gamza. They have sent him a cease and desist letter. And for those who don't know, a cease and desist letter is basically a letter informing the recipient of the letter to cease and desist of some form of activity. I.e. the letter is basically, stop doing this thing or we're gonna sue. And in this case, Gamza has not received the cease and desist for his YouTube content, so I haven't quite started looking into the price of Legal Eagle in case they come for me next. He's out of my budget, by the way. But they specifically went after Gamza because of the 3D STL files that he sells, that he has on offer as part of his Patreon. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Is this good for the miniature wargaming hobby? War Games Workshop in the the right to shut this down and what does this mean for all creators and hobbyists in general we got a pretty packed in offering today let me tell you so firstly is this good for the miniature wargaming hobby <sighs> what a delicate little question to ask so I think in order to understand this, we need to understand the context around which this is all taking place. So the people sending out this cease and desist letter is Games Workshop. And this isn't exactly out of character for them. You might not know this, but Games Workshop have a, a certain reputation for being, shall we say, pretty litigious. They are the opposite of gun shy. They are gun full, gun bold, gun go. To name one example, they famously went after Maggie Hogarth in 2012. She is a self-published author and she created the book Spots the Space Marine, a delightful little space-based romance novel. Games Workshop, however, did not like this, and not because of the writing style either. It was that they claimed they had a trademark ownership over the term a space marine. And so, therefore, they contacted Amazon, who was distributing and selling the book on behalf of Hogarth, and Games Workshop ordered them to take the book down, which Amazon complied with. And as a result, all sales of the book were halted immediately. Hogarth's book was removed from the store. So Hogarth contacted Games Workshop. She asked them to rescind their claims. And they wouldn't. They just wouldn't do it. They felt that they owned the trademark to the term Space Marine. This claim, by the way, extremely contentious to say the least. And as an individual, Maggie Hogarth just simply couldn't afford trademark counsel in order to take Games Workshop to court. So she was basically screwed. There was nothing she could do. And it was only until a non-profit organization like the Electronic Frontiers Foundation got involved that Games Workshop eventually backed down. And that is only one of many examples of Games Workshop aggressively defending their IP or their employees issuing legal threats against other creators, other companies. One of the more unfortunate examples being Futsor Miniatures. They were originally called War Banner Studios, but Games Workshop thought that was a little bit too close to the term Warhammer, a completely different word. So they ordered War Banner to change their name, which they did. Incidentally, they changed their name to Dark Peak Games. And then they were also issued another cease and desist from a different company, Peak Games. 
And so they had to change their name again to Futsor Miniatures as we know them today. They got worse luck than Satomo Yamaguchi. And of course, there was also the time the Games Workshop tried to shut down Chapter House Studios as well. Everybody remembers that one. Chapter House Studios were a bit seller and they actually fought Games Workshop in court. And as a result, they actually came out of court kind of the winner. Sort of. A bit. It's pretty complicated. But ultimately, the case bankrupted them and they folded. And I'm not gonna get into the chapter house trial here. If you are interested in a full video going over that case, let me know in the comments below. Then just this year, Games Workshop issued a manual claim on Midwinter Minis, a YouTube video reviewing the Warhammer Plus service. That copyright claim being for Warhammer Plus footage in the Warhammer Plus review, which is not not a very strong claim, <laughs> to be to be perfectly frank. Very easily covered by fair use. But Games Workshop did not rescind the claim until there was a furor online about it. And even then, they did so with barely even an apology. So, to say that Games Workshop have a little bit of a history with DMCAs, takedown notices, cease and desist letters, litigation in general, it's a, it's a little bit of an understatement. Their readiness to use illegal threats and litigation to get what they want is well known in the industry. And so now, just this month, we have another creator contacted by Games Workshop being ordered to take something down from the internet. A deal as old as time. And because of the reasonable fear that Patreon will simply accept Games Workshop's versions of events, Gamza has taken down his 3D STL files from his Patreon in response. But an important point to note here is that none of this has actually been litigated. None of this has been a shook out in a courtroom. No judge has ordered this takedown. No court of law has. These actions are all a result of the threat of legal action from Games Workshop. Very important distinction to understand. Nothing here has been settled. And I don't think that this was good, actually. And okay, I know, I understand what many people will be saying or thinking right now. Games Workshop are under an obligation to defend their trademark claims or else they risk weakening them. They could potentially lose their trademarks if they don't enforce their trademarks. But for a second, let's think about Games Workshop's behavior and think about who are the people receiving these cease and desist letters and these takedown notices. Well, it's not big creators and it's not multinational companies. It's small creators, it's small companies. People who would not be able to contest Games Workshop's claims in a courtroom. And that tells us something about the nature of the claims the Games Workshop are making. Because Games Workshop already turn a blind eye to potential copyright and trademark infringements in the industry. They pick and choose who they go after, who they bare their teeth to. They're not sending these letters to companies like Mantic Games or Ubisoft Blizzard. They're sending them to small businesses and individual creators. They're putting claims in with vendors like Amazon and Patreon, companies who will defer to them without much question. And so what does that tell us? Ooh. Well, it tells us that Games Workshop don't actually want to go to court and prove the substance of their claims. They just want others to be shut down. And this is a huge red flag to me, because this is a practice that is well known in the legal world. Games Workshop are engaging in what is known as trademark bullying. And this is a particular practice that bigger companies who are dominant in a specific industry can do to shut down competition that comes from smaller companies and creators. And how this works is that a company will spread their net as far and wide as possible, looking for the most remote, minor potential infringements and then reach out to the vendors who host those products and get them to take them down. Looking for the most minor or potential infringements on their trademarks and IP. And then they'll threaten litigation, they'll contact the vendors who are hosting these products, and they will get them taken off the market. 
And most small companies can't fight this. They can't do anything about this. They can't afford to hire trademark counsel. They can't afford to fight a protracted legal battle in a courtroom. Often, this would be financially ruinous to them. And whether they won in court or not would be irrelevant. By the end, they would be bankrupt. This is what happened to Chapter House. So what could these smaller creators do? Well, nothing. They have no option but to simply accept the claim and stop selling the product. And that is exactly the intention of trademark bullying. That is the purpose of it. There is no intention here from Games Workshop to actually contest any of their claims in a courtroom. They just hope that their opponent will lack the funds to fight them on it, and that vendors like Amazon, YouTube, Patreon will defer to them, which they almost always do. And every single time a creator acquiesces to Games Workshop's claims, it simply emboldens Games Workshop to go after more creators. So, is this the type of behavior that we want in our hobby? If Games Workshop were genuinely concerned about their IP and the trademark, if they really were concerned about people buying STL files of their products from third-party sellers, then there is another solution open to them. And I won't even accept payment for this one, Games Workshop. They could... Drum roll, please. They could make their miniatures cheaper, more accessible, and even sell their own 3D STL files. In other words, they could compete honestly and fairly with other creators. And I guarantee you that if they did that, then most recasters, and when I say recasters, I mean people who are literally selling one-to-one -one versions of Games Workshop products, they would go out of business almost immediately. But Games Workshop don't want to do that because that would devalue their products. And they want us to think that these objects are expensive luxury goods. So instead, they're hiring more lawyers to troll the internet looking for more opportunities to shut down other creators. Even if those other creators aren't creating products that are identical to Games Workshop products. It's just enough for Games Workshop that the products look kind of similar if you squint. So Games Workshop as a company, they're not interested in innovating in this space or thinking about cool things that they could do with 3D printing. No, they have a very restrictive attitude to it and it's hurting us as consumers. We are losing access to more choice and cheaper models and it's having a chilling effect on the entire industry. And sure, I do accept the point that many creators out there are flying extremely close to the sun when it comes to their designs. Let's not beat around the bush here. There are a ton of 3D STL files. There are a ton of models out there that are extremely reminiscent of Games Workshop products. However, you would be surprised at how little Games Workshop actually owns or how much of Games Workshop designs are unique to them. Just like Games Workshop were surprised when they lost on two-thirds of their claims during the Chapter House trial. Because seriously, Games Workshop are in a little bit of a glass house here, and they're chucking some big old meaty bricks around. All we need to do is look at some Games Workshop products, and we'll see that they too are flying pretty close to the sun. In fact, I think it's time for a kangaroo court! So let's get to some copyright lawyer in off the books. And first up on the docket, we've got the Imperial Guard Gideon Infantrymen. They're very original, very original. Oh wait, no, that's right, now I remember. There's the 1997 hit movie Starship Troopers from Paul Verhoeven. Let's have a little gander at the mobile infantry. Kah! Yeah, I don't think it's very original anymore. Cease and desist. Oh, and of course, we have the 100% original Eldar, and of course, the Eldar. And a little A and a little I ain't gonna save you from me. Cease and desist. Here we got the Necrons, and we'll be back to them. But let's not get too wild here. It's not as if Games Workshop would simply claw out something from an existing franchise and crudely insert it into their own setting, now, is it? Not like, say, I don't know, the appointed star. 
Yeah, I'm afraid that was created by a little fella called Mr. Morecock. A man so respected in the fantasy community that we have all collectively agreed not to make fun of his name. Cease and desist. But hey, this is all in the past, you might say. It's the old games workshop. They wouldn't do it no more. Three words. Leagues of Votan. Or should I say, League of Starcraft. Another little tidbit, did you know the Games Workshop took terms like Plasteel and Stub Gun from AD 2000, Judge Dredd? Well, they did! Cease and desist! And there are many, many more, but let's not belabor the point here. Games Workshop's claims of originality are as weak as my grand aunt's brick pods, which unfortunately gave out on the way to her probate lawyer, resulting in her untimely death. And yet, Games Workshop are throwing out legal notices as if these claims are as watertight as my inheritance of my great aunt's 1976 Chevrolet Camaro. Something which was never disputed, even if she did threaten to write me out of the will on the day before her death. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I rest my kiss. Oh, that'll be my DUI kiss now. I hope those witnesses took my bribe. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your counsel, Rich Whiteman. No, thank you, Discourse. So, taking all that into consideration, can we truly say that all of Games Workshop's designs are wholly original either? And for the record, I think this is fine. I'm not criticizing Games Workshop for their designs. I think a lot of them look really cool. I love the setting of Warhammer, but I also think that a lot of the designs of smaller creators and smaller companies are really cool too, regardless of their inspiration. And I think that it is an inevitability of creative enterprise that you will be inspired by designs that came before you and that we build atop previous iterations. Because let's be clear here, the models that are being claimed for by Games Workshop are not one-to-ones. These aren't recasts. They are, to my eye, original products that were obviously inspired by Games Workshop products. Just like Games Workshop products have been obviously inspired by products that came before them. And sure, that's my perspective. I don't think that these models would cause confusion amongst consumers in the marketplace. And you may disagree. That's fine. I expect there will be a variety of opinions on whether or not these products infringe upon Games Workshop's copyright or not. But here's the thing. The behavior that Games Workshop have engaged in this trademark bullying, it sets them up as the final arbiter. They control what is acceptable or not. They control what are the boundaries. They control what creators can make. And I honestly believe that there are no changes to the design of these models that would have satisfied Games Workshop. Because Games Workshop would not find anything that could stand on the tabletop in lieu of their official models acceptable. So let's be careful here. Let's not treat Games Workshop's argument as reality. Their contentions are just that. They are contentions, and they are highly motivated, to say the least, to be in their own favor. But we can't take their word for it. And importantly, I don't trust Games Workshop's judgment as to what is a reasonable and an unreasonable demand. Again, just this year, look at the copyright claim the Games Workshop manually placed on Midwinter Mini's Warhammer Plus review. They manually placed this copyright claim on his review. This meant that they blocked his ad revenue and they only rescinded their claim in the face of sustained vocal pressure from the hobby community. And when they backtracked, they erroneously stated that the claim had been automatic, something which was provably untrue. And I'm also not sure if they ever paid back the ad revenue that should have gone to Midwinter Minis. So Games Workshop do have a history of going far beyond what is reasonable. And that makes everybody else very nervous. There was a time when Games Workshop were claiming the trademark terms to words like fanatic, marauder, tie, yes, the 19th letter in the Greek alphabet, or even dark angel. 
And these are obviously generic terms. And this is why we saw the great rebrand of Games Workshop naming convention in the mid 2010s. It was because the Chapter House trial shone a light on just how shaky a lot of their assertions truly are. And in preparation for this video, I looked up what they still claim the trademarks to. And it's absolutely wild. They think they own the rights to the terms Citadel, Space Marine, Inquisitor, White Dwarf. I mean, these are generic terms and they would likely be easily contestable in court. It's absolute nonsense. You could even argue that the very term Warhammer is generic enough to refer to almost any miniature. But this has a massive impact on the rest of the industry. When these legal letters, when these DMCA takedowns start getting sent out by big companies like Games Workshop, it creates uncertainty amongst other creators, amongst other companies. And it has a chilling effect on other artists, on 3D artists, and it impacts on smaller miniature companies. It impacts on content creators. And it basically harms the entire hobby industry because as mentioned most of them can't afford to fight these claims in a courtroom and that chilling effect where people are afraid to create things where they are worried about accidentally stumbling into this massive minefield laid by games workshop so they just don't create anything that could potentially even be adjacent to that this is exactly what games workshop want when they throw out these frivolous and unprincipled threats they want to prevent other creators from selling their products and honestly i think the games workshop should face consequences for this so it doesn't matter what you think of gamza in principle i am against this behavior from games workshop i think it's bad for the miniature wargaming hobby to have a big litigious company swinging its warhammer about it any other competition and this will increasingly become a problem as the 3D marketplace grows. Because seemingly, Games Workshop's intention to interact with the 3D market consists only as an enforcement agent. And we now know the Games Workshop are hiring more lawyers. They're hiring more enforcers. So this chilling effect, it's not going to go away. It's going to get worse. And that really frightens me. Because this is the future of of this hobby. And if you find this interesting, why not check out my analysis of that time the Games Workshop kicked Miniac out of Warhammer World for leaking a model here. And if you find this content interesting, if you want to support the work that I do here fighting for consumers in the miniature wargaming hobby, why not check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash discourse miniatures. And a huge thanks to Steven Jackson, Sonic Bread, and Beauregard Equipment. Thank you so much, guys. And a huge, huge thank you to all my patrons. I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.